Good morning, fellas, and welcome back to Me Plays Games. My name is Matt, and the first generation of Pokémon is... an experience. Sleep lasted forever and you can't attack on the turn you wake up. Perfectly accurate moves can miss because of a missing equal sign in the code. Your critical hit chance depends on your base speed stat. I could go on, but you get the point. There's a lot of quirks in Gen 1, which makes it fun in its own weird kind of way. So today, I thought I'd take a look at some of the moves that work differently in the first generation. We've got glitches, moves that were completely overhauled, and glitches. Glitches. Lots and lots of glitches. Alright, let's get the show on the road. Self-Destruct and Explosion were introduced in Gen 1, and they're a lot of fun. Do big damage and go boom. Love it. Nowadays, they're 200 and 250 base power respectively, but in Generation 1, they were 130 and 170. They're still absolute nukes though, because from Gens 1 to 4, the moves actually halved the target's defense during the damage calculation. So they were effectively 260 and 340 power. Why not simply make a move that's 340 power, you ask? Well, because you kinda couldn't. The defense having mechanic was actually a workaround for a technical limitation. A lot of things in the game are stored as 8-digit binary integers, and that includes the power of moves. That means the highest power move could possibly be is 255, since that's the biggest number you can write in binary with 8 digits. So to boost these moves from powerhouse to nuclear weapon territory, they mess with the damage formula instead. In Generation 2, they were boosted even further, with Explosion being buffed to 250 power, which effectively became 500 with the defense having mechanism. Since they don't have your defenses anymore, these moves are stronger in Gen 1 compared to nowadays. But now, let's we'll take a look at a move that's way worse in Gen 1. Like, so bad you'd be better off using Splash. Currently, Focus Energy is a move that boosts your chance of getting a critical hit. Not the greatest move in the universe, but it was basically useless in Gen 1. It was meant to multiply your crit chance by 4, but for whatever reason, it divides it by 4 instead. So by using this move, you're actively making your Pokémon worse. Well, most of the time at least. Depending on what Pokémon you're using, there are technically some use cases for Focus Energy. We're stacking shenanigans on shenanigans today, isn't it great? In Gen 1, critical hits ignore any stat changes the user and target have. So, for example, if a Pokémon is spamming Harden, you can break through its defense boost if you get a crit. Similarly, if your attack has been lowered, crits bypass that as well. But it also ignores your own attack boosts. So if you were to use Swords Dance, for example, you don't want to get crits, because they'd actually do less damage than a normal hit. Right, so I guess I've got to go over even more Gen 1 shenanigans. Unlike later generations, crits don't do 2 times damage in Gen 1. In fact, the damage multiplier depends on your level. Back then, your level played a role in the damage calculation as well, not just your stats. So a level 20 Pidgey with an attack stat of 40 would do less damage than a level 25 Pidgey with the same stat. Whenever you get a crit, the game will double your level in the damage calculation. So a level 5 Pokémon getting a crit would be treated like a level 10, and a level 97 Pokémon would effectively be level 194. That means the higher your level, the higher your damage multiplier will be if you get a crit. A level 5 will only get a 50% boost, but at level 100 you get a 95.2% boost. So crits will always do slightly less than double damage in Gen 1. That means that even at level 100, they're ever so slightly weaker than a Sword Stance boosted hit, since that move doubles your attack stat the first time you use it. So by using Focus Energy on a Pokémon with Sword Stance, you have a better chance of getting Sword Stance boosted hits, as opposed to the weaker critical hits. That's an incredibly specific use case, though, because the only Pokémon that learn both moves are Beedrill, Pinsir, and Scyther. Plus, the difference it makes is minuscule, not even 5%, and it's really not worth running Focus Energy to do 5% more damage 20% of the time. The only time it might be helpful is if you sit there setting up a second or third sword stance. But you're better off just running more attacks or better boosting moves. Just don't use Focus Energy, man, it's not worth it. Next, let's look at Struggle. You only get this move if you run out of power points, and it can't be copied or called by stuff like Metronome, Mimic, or Transform. It's a 50 power move that does recoil damage whenever you use it, and in this game only, it's normal type, which means rock types resist it and ghost types are immune to it. In every other generation, Struggle is typeless, meaning it does neutral damage to everything. And fun fact, this move is listed as having 10 power points in Gen 1. That doesn't actually mean anything though, because power points never get deducted from this move, since the only reason you're using it is because you have no power points. It actually has a power point value coded in every generation for some reason. In Gen 2, onwards, it's got one power point. Allegedly. Anyway, Struggle being normal type means it's actually literally impossible for some Pokémon to solo run in Gen 1 game. Magikarp, Caterpie, and Metapod can't learn any attacking moves that aren't normal type, which means it's impossible for them to hit the ghost types in Lavender Town. Once you run out of tackles, which they're immune to, and whatever non-attacking moves you've got, Struggle also won't do anything. And even if you found some fancy schmancy way to skip Pokémon Tower, let's just say Agatha's got some plans for you when you get to the Elite Four. There are other Pokémon that only get normal type attacking moves, but they've got other tricks up their sleeves for ghosts. 
Ghosts, Eevee, and for some reason Scyther only get normal attacks in Red and Blue, and Pinsir only gets normal and fighting moves. But they can learn TMs, including all the universal ones. Well, Toxic doesn't work, because all the Ghost types in Gen 1 are also Poison types, which are immune to getting poisoned themselves. Nope, the answer is Bide of all things. In Generation 1, Ghost types are immune to normal and fighting moves, but only the ones that use the standard damage formula. Moves where you plug in the base power, your attack stat, their defense stat, blah 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 blah. But Bide works differently. When you use this move, you sit around absorbing damage for 2 to 3 turns, and once the move ends, you deal double the amount of damage you took. Since the move doesn't use the regular damage formula, it can hit Ghosts in Gen 1, despite them being immune to normal moves. So Eevee, Pinsir, and Scyther actually can make it through Pokémon Tower in Gen 1. In a similar vein, Counter and Seismic Toss can also hit Ghosts despite being fighting moves, which they're also normally immune to. And on the flip side, the Ghost-type move Nightshade can also hit normal types. Speaking of weird type interactions, here's one the Battle Simulators had wrong up until 2014. In the more recent Pokémon games, certain types are immune to certain status conditions. Electric types can't be paralyzed, Poison types can't be poisoned, and that makes sense, that's all well and good. And for the most part, that's also true in Gen 1. But you're only immune to statuses if the move that's hitting you matches your type. That means Thunderbolt can't paralyze electric types, but Body Slam can. But the part Battle Simulators had wrong was Body Slam's interaction with normal type Pokémon. Before 2014, it was thought that normal types could be paralyzed by Body Slam, but that turned out not to be true. They're immune to this specific source of paralysis, because it's a normal type move. And that's kind of a big deal, because the three best Pokémon in the game besides the Legend Legendaries are all normal type. Tauros, Snorlax, and Chansey are all immune to Body Slam paralysis. Since Battle Simulators had that wrong, they got paralyzed when they really shouldn't have quite a bit, because Tauros and Snorlax usually run Body Slam. Pokémon first came out internationally in 1998, so Simulators had it wrong over 16 years into the game's life. Oh, and by the way, that can't get status if you share a type with a move rule? Yeah, that's not even 100% true. Bug types can be poisoned by Twin Needle. This game's a disaster, I love it. Next, let's take a look at two moves that are staples of playthroughs, but are complete garbage in competitive play. Dig and Fly. These moves are awful because they take two turns to execute, so your opponent has time to switch into something that resists or is immune to them. Dugtrio use Dig? I don't think so. Say hello to my bird. Yeah, you're semi-invulnerable while the move charges up, but that doesn't mean much when your opponent can switch out. Despite being terrible, these moves are actually banned in Gen 1 competitive play, because there's a glitch that makes them completely broken under the right conditions. If a Pokémon with Dig or Fly gets paralyzed, they can sort of become invincible. If you get fully paralyzed during the semi-invulnerable turn, the move will end. But your semi-invulnerability won't be reset, so almost no moves can hit you till you use Dig or Fly again. The only moves that work on you in this state are Bide, Swift, and Transform. Swift is weak, so nothing ever runs it, Bide is horrible, and Transform really doesn't solve the problem. You turn into the Pokémon that used Fly, but you still can't actually damage them. So Dig and Fly were banned, because Paralysis is all over the place. Stun Spore, Thunder Wave, Body Slam, it just wouldn't have been a good time. And this glitch can even happen in playthroughs if you're not thinking. One time, my friend Elias and I were racing through Pokémon Red and Blue, and I was fighting the trainers in Surge's Gym. I got paralyzed by one of the Gym Trainer's Pokémon and used Dig, forgetting the glitch existed. So I just sat there being invincible and won the fight. We never finished the race, though, because Elias' game crashed in Lavender Town, and he didn't want to go through Rock Tunnel a second time, so unfortunately I don't have the footage handy. Now let's look at two moves that switch the target out against their will, Roar and Whirlwind. Nowadays, they have negative 6 priority, meaning they'll go after every other move, except for Trick Room. But in Generation 2, they just had negative 1 priority, alongside the other negative priority moves like Counter and Vital Throw. In Gen 1, though, they had a priority of 0, which meant they could potentially move before standard moves like Ice Beam and Recover. In Gen 1, you can use Aurora and Whirlwind and Wild Encounters to end the battle. But in Trainer Battles, they do... nothing. And I don't mean they're just not good and you shouldn't use them, I mean nothing. They straight up had no effect whatsoever against other trainers. But despite being completely useless in Trainer Battles, your rival in Red and Blue uses both of them. He teaches his Pidgeotto Whirlwind halfway through the game, and apparently he didn't learn his lesson. If you don't pick Bulbasaur as your starter, he'll also have an Arcanine by the end of the game. Not only does Pidgeot still have Whirlwind, but he also taught his Arcanine Roar. So he's got two completely useless move slots in the champion fight. Oh wait, no he doesn't. He's got even more. During the rest of the game, his Execute has Leech Seed, Poison Powder, Solar Beam, and Growth. Yeah, Executor has none of those moves. Once it evolves, its moves are Hypnosis, Barrage, Stomp, and... that's it. 
The fourth move slot is empty. Mind you, this isn't possible for you to do in Gen 1. Once you have four moves on your Pokémon, you can't delete any. You can only replace them with new moves. I think this guy is performing illegal brain surgeries. Cancer region scandal, more at 11. But wait, it gets worse! Your rival also has a Rhydon! Despite being a ground and rock type, the rival doesn't teach it any ground or rock moves, just normal ones. In fact, in the champion battle, his Rhydon knows Leer and Tail Whip. You know, two moves that do the exact same thing. So he effectively has three moves on four of his eight possible Pokémon. Pidgeot and Arcanine have moves that do nothing, Rhydon has two identical moves, and Executor straight up missing one. The only Pokémon he's got that are nonsense free are his Starter and his Gyarados. Alright, that got off topic, let's do one more and call it a video. Nowadays, Blizzard isn't the greatest move in the universe. 110 power, 10% chance to freeze, but it's only got 70% accuracy. That terrible accuracy means it's not used all that often. Most Ice types use the more reliable Ice Beam. There are some exceptions, of course. It doesn't miss in Hail or Snow, so Pokémon like Obama Snow and Vanillox can spam perfectly accurate Blizzards, since they set up the weather with their abilities. Rotom Frost runs Blizzard as well, but that's kinda cause it doesn't have a choice. When Rotom changes forms, it learns one move of whatever type it's turning into. Rotom Heat gets Overheat, Rotom Wash gets Hydro Pump, and so on and so forth. Rotom Frost's exclusive move is Blizzard, and that's the only Ice move it can learn, no Ice Beam. Which sucks, because it can't boost Blizzard's accuracy in Hail or Snow, like Obama Snow and company. Anyway, Blizzard was way stronger in Gen 1 for a couple reasons. First off, its power was nerfed in Gen 6. From Gens 1 to 5, it was 120 power instead of 110. It also had 90% accuracy instead of 70. So on average, it did more damage than Ice Beam. But wait, there's more! It still had the same 10% chance to freeze, but in this game if you get frozen, you just kinda perish. You'll never unfreeze naturally. The only ways to thaw out are by using an Ice Heal, or your opponent using Haze or a Fire-type move that can burn you. So if you get frozen, you're dead, especially if you're playing against other humans and you can't use items. But wait, it gets even more ridiculous! In the original Japanese games, Pokémon Red and Green, Blizzard had the same power and accuracy, but a whopping 30% chance to freeze. Thankfully, it was toned down before Pokémon came out internationally, because having that high a chance to just delete a Pokémon from the battle is absurd. Alright, that'll do it for this video. I've got, like, a million other moves to talk about, so stay tuned for a part two. I'll see you around. Good night, fellas. Sleep well.